All right, 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 all right. You guys know how I feel about it, but uh, on this day, on this day, um, I'll receive it. Uh, welcome to Genesis Metro Church, 3330, El Dorado. <laughs> Um, if you are a guest with us today, thank you uh, for coming. Uh, we appreciate you being here uh, for our soft launch. Um, understand that not everything is working as it should, and uh, we knew that coming in. And so I hope that you'll give us a little bit of grace as we work out all of the technical difficulties. Um, but for those of you that are guests, just to catch you up, um, Carrie and I moved here 20 years ago to plant Genesis Metro Church. And on this very ground, it was promised to us about 17 years ago. And so walking in today is walking into a 20-year promise. And so it's incredibly exciting and fulfilling. A lot of people have been asking this week, um, how do you feel? Uh, how, you know, how do you feel uh, about everything? Like your dream is coming true. And I just want you to know, I just want you to know, I'm not denigrating in any way, shape, or form. Thank you for asking. Thank you for, you know, sharing. But... When people ask me how I feel, it's like asking a robot why, why he does what he does, okay? Um, I, don't, I don't relate well to my emotions, and it's a, it's a downfall. I'm not saying this as a strength. I'm just saying that, that I, don't like to, I don't like to get into that well of emotion, and the first service did kind of what you did, and I honestly, I wasn't ready for that, and that shook me. Um, and so I also wanted to get done on time because we had to turn the parking lot over. But in this service, I'm going to, like, let it loose a little bit because, because I, don't, I don't have the time constraints. Um, so I'm sorry, first service, uh, you didn't get the whole sermon. But anyway, um, so when you're asking me how I feel, um, I think it's important for, for you to know a little bit about old Pastor Tim. Um, you know, I honestly look at it... Uh, maybe slightly different than some of you might think I look at it. Um, you know, Karen and I, yes, did we come here and plant and, you know, all we had was some duct tape and a Bible? Um, yeah, we did that, and that's what God uh, told us to do, and we did it, and we were obedient. But when I look out at this audience, um, I'm going to be quite honest with you. I don't look at it like it's, it's uh, Tim Bourne's dream or it's the Bourne's family clan vision or something like that. I really look at it like it's, it's ours. This is our church. This is the collective. It doesn't belong to me. It never has. And this is just as much about you as it is about me today. And so we can thank God and we give God a round of applause for what he has done through all the people at Genesis Metro. I say this with all sincerity that uh, I could not have done this um, on my own, and that it took all of us doing our parts. Even if you've been here two weeks, um, it took all of us doing our parts, and it's going to take all of us doing our parts as we move forward. And so I'm encouraged um, by this moment, and, and what I'm feeling um, is a tremendous sense of accomplishment. Um, in the Bible, if you look at from cover to cover, there's a lot of narratives, right? Um, very few people in the Bible get to receive the vision and then see the vision come to pass. When you think of David, um, David was given the, the inspiration to build the temple, but he didn't get to build the temple. David, or David's son Solomon built it. Whenever you think of Moses, which is what we're going to preach about, coming out of Egypt after 430 years of slavery, you know, he got to leave and go into the wilderness, but he didn't make it into the promised land. And so to get to see the vision come to pass um, after being given the vision 20 years ago, uh, that is a tremendous, tremendous feeling. And I say all that to encourage you, that if you were ever wondering, <laughs> if, if it's taken a little while, okay, if it's taken a little while, trust me, it's worth it to hold on to the God dream. We've been talking about Joseph for 13 weeks and my favorite line in that whole story, and if I write a book about Joseph, it will be called, Here Comes 
that dreamer. And so today, I just want you to know that you have worked with us to make this possible, and we are so excited. And I just want to say thank you for all of your hours and all of your service. As a matter of fact, um, I'm going to read my text, and then I'm going to get into a little bit of Genesis Metro culture. Um, it says in Isaiah 43, this is what the Lord says. And then he's referring to what he has done to explain who he is. He says, he who made a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters. God is saying, this is what I did. I am able to make a way, a path through the waters. And so God is able to make a way, proverbially, where there is no way. And if I tried to sit here and tell you all the ways that we shouldn't be sitting in here today, time would fail for me to have the opportunity to do that. But let's just say that until Friday around 3, 3.30 in the afternoon, we did not know that we were going to be able to meet in here today. And so we had our final inspections, and I will say that if you were on the inside of the story, which I'm thankful that you're not, um, God made a way when there wasn't a way, and then hundreds of people showed up. And this is kind of like a loose time lapse because um, we don't have time to show it all. But this is what it looked like um, on Friday, and then like this is what it looks like now. And what I have to say is that Genesis Metro always shows up. And let's give all the people that showed up a round of applause without you. Without you, this literally would not have been possible. People worked night and day from Friday until last night, late into the night, to make this possible. And I want to give one more acknowledgement. The Bible always says, give honor to whom honor is due. Um, our sound guys have done an amazing job. Would you guys give them a round of applause? They helped set up the room for us and are passing off the torch of a tremendous amount of technology. Dude, I can't wait to show you guys what I can do with this screen. I mean, man, I just want to get to the point that I can draw on it and I can be like a teacher up here, you know. That would be just amazing, like a telestrator. I could draw football plays. There's so many things, so many things that I could do. Um, but anyway, whenever God is talking to Isaiah and then Isaiah is preaching to a people, you have to understand the context is that the Israelites have gone into captivity and God is promising um, what he's going to do for that generation, and he starts off his dialogue with what he has already done. So God says, this is what I have done in the past. How do you know what God is going to do in the future? Generically and thematically, principally even, you could say, you can know what God is going to do because of what God has always done. If you look in the Bible, God is always finding people who are undeserving, who are not special, and he calls them, and then he does great things with their life. God has promoted and has provided life-changing moments for the last 20 years at Genesis Metro Church. And the reason why your family showed up and help for the last 48 hours, and people were, I mean, down scrubbing. We moved every rock. Did y'all know that? Did you see it out there? Every single rock was moved from 9750 to 3330. And, and I just thought, wow, the only reason why anyone would ever want to move a bunch of rocks for no seeming reason is that I'm just guessing, I'm just making some assumptions here, is that you have experienced life change at Genesis Metro Church. You, you have experienced the promise that we make every single week. And the reason why you show up is that you want, I assume, someone else to experience exactly what your family has experienced. How do we know what God is going to do for the next 20 years? Because we can look at what he has done for the last 20 years. And the church said, amen. You see, Moses says, 
you guys were once in Egypt, right? You were once in slavery. 430 years they were in slavery. And he says, and then I drew you out, right? And I drew you out into a different place. The second point I'm going to make is, I'm going to get it right. We are not there anymore. We are here. And I don't know if you feel that, but I'm going to tell you, when I say we are here, if you, have you ever waited 20 years for something to come to pass? Because I haven't. And so today I'm going to tell you, we're not there anymore. We are here. And, and if you knew what God has done to make all that possible, it would just blow your mind. I don't have time to do that right now. But, but I want you to know that there's a distinction and a difference that we make when we look at where we've been and where we are now. And when we look at all that, that God has done and all the things that he is doing, we are excited to know that we were once there, but we are now here. Now, that I want your family to be able to experience that. Like, I want you to be able to look in the mirror, and I want you to say, man, when we walked through those doors, we were one way. And then as a result of the preaching, as a result of the worship, as a result of the life groups, as a, lo- a result of the crazy stuff we do, which if you're new to our church, we do an annual men's conference called Uprising, and we do a sisterhood conference that's going to be here this year. Very excited about that. And we do crazy challenges. Sometimes you might eat things that you never thought you could eat. And so um, when I think about all of those memories, I think about where we were, and that's not where we are now. We are now here, and I see the progression. The preacher I was when I moved here to Frisco, Texas, is not the preacher that I am now. The man that I am then, was then, is not the man that I am now. When we moved here, we had a one-year-old, folks. We had a one-year-old little baby, uh, little baby Jordan, and today he's standing on the stage leading you in worship, right? I have another son that two weeks from now is going to preach the grand opening in Fuse. And then my third son, who is 15 years old, is learning how to drive. And so I say that (laughs) not as a praise. I say it as a warning. (laughs) But I want you to know that it's, it's not hard for me to look at where I was and say, man, look what God has done. And I want that same progression in your family. You see that if you're faithful and you walk after God, you worship after God, you'll see these moments in your timeline. You'll see a progression. It doesn't mean that it's all going to go great. I promise you there'll be some unexpected punches that you never saw coming. But to know that your life is on track with your maker, that your creator has a plan for you. And he says that if you'll remember, I'm going to make a promise to you in the future, and it's based upon what I've done in the past. You were in slavery when I found you, and then I drew you out to another place. If you can't relate to that theme, then I'm sorry you are broken. There's something wrong with you because if we name the name of Christ, we should all have a story where we were lost in our sin and God's grace found us and drew us out into a better place. That's everyone's story that's sitting in this room today. I can tell you that's my story. And so we want to tell you that, man, God intends to do great things. I want your family to be able to say, man, when we got to Genesis Metro, it's not a means that everybody in here is just like on the verge of going under, but some are, some are, but I know some of your stories when you got to Genesis Metro, I look out here and I could, I could preach your story and you wouldn't like it, well you would, but like you wouldn't want me to tell because I'm your preacher, anyway, so, but man, how far has God brought us, how far has God brought your family, your marriage, how far has God brought your children? God be the glory for that. Let's give God a round of applause for that. Man, it's just, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming to think about where we were. And man, that building, it served us well. It served us well. 
It's like if you had a beater. Anybody have a beater when you were first growing up? Like a terrible little hoopty car? Yeah, man. It's like you appreciate that old. You like look back upon it. You're like, man, that was a great little car. You wouldn't want to drive it today, though. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. That car served its purpose. But God has established us here. He brought us out. And he's brought us in. God creates the path. Just remember this when it comes to the story of Moses and what God is saying in Isaiah 43. God creates the path, but it's our responsibility to pursue. I don't know if you remember all of the story, and I'm just going to I'm not going to take for granted that everyone in here knows all the ins and outs of the Bible, but Moses was chosen by God to lead the people out. And if you were going to pick a top 10 leader in the Bible, it's Moses. I mean, he gets called and he leads these people out. And, and he didn't just like lead them out with like the clothes on their back. I don't know if y'all remember this story, but Moses led the people through a process in which at the end, the Egyptians gave them all the gold and silver and property that they could carry. They went out with a song on their lips. Kind of like we came out here today. You know, we're all singing. I'm watching people crying in the audience because this is just as much fulfillment for you as it is for me. I mean, it's a celebration. And they were high-fiving each other. Yay, God. He smote those Egyptians. And I don't know if you have any Egyptians, but I got some Egyptians, all right? And God smote them. It says that they would never rise again. And, man, it just feels good to know that God delivers on his word even when the haters are going to hate, hate, hate. Anyway, I digress. God leads them out, and the first obstacle, the first one, not like three obstacles, okay? The first obstacle was the Red Sea. And immediately, the people that were cheering and that were high-fiving one another, you know what they're doing now? They're complaining, and they're grumbling, does anybody have a teenager in here, by show of hands? Yeah? You guys know what, when I say grumbled, is that, does, that, does that strike a connotation for anybody in the room? It's like, Ugh. you know. And I, I don't know, I, I only have boys, so I don't know if girls, do girls do the same thing? Do girls grumble? Okay, well, sorry, ladies. They're, they're against you. Man, when I think of grumble, like my kids, they don't even make words. It's just... Sounds, you're like, uh, uh. you ask them questions, it's like they can't articulate. Is anybody like, I'm like, what? I can't understand what you're saying. Does anybody else say this? I think they just do this all the time. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Words. Words. Anyway, I digress. I digress. Let it go, Tim. They come up to this Red Sea, and you would think that the, the law of yesterday, <laughs> of what God just did, would carry into today. But how quickly, how quickly did they forget? And they instantly started saying to Moses, man, did you just bring us out here to die? <laughs> did you just... Like, it, it was much better when we were <laughs> in Egypt. Like, it was much better when we were a slave. Like, it was much better. Like, no, it wasn't. It wasn't much. There was never a time it was much better in your life before you met God. There's never a day in your life that was much better before you met God. It's all after God. You can mark your life. After God, my life was better because no matter what we win when we have God in our life and so here they are singing and chanting let's just say on Monday and then on Friday they are cursing the name of God and now they want to go back to their former life that was way worse now you just let me know when I'm preaching your story okay so we are celebrating whenever we get Jesus in our heart whenever we you know come into a church and like this atmosphere it's kind of like if you were used to like a traditional church, there's a lot of pep in this audience, right? Like a, a lot of energy, right? And people are, you know, energetic, energetically, enthusiastically worshiping God. Like, 
If you don't have that in you, it, it feels almost awkward. Like, what are all these people doing? Do they know something that I don't know? I would challenge your passion level that sometimes we stop and we get distracted, and now all of a sudden the God that we were once excited about, we're at our Red Sea, and we don't see a way forward, and now we're complaining. We're saying, God, why did you bring me out here? Why did you do this to me? And God is saying, if you'll just calm down, right? By the way, have you ever said that to your wife? Is any husband ever said that? Like, it, it doesn't work. You know, it, it actually has the opposite effect. If they're ever coming at you real strong, he's like, hey, babe, just calm down. <laughs> like, I'll show you calm. You know, I don't know if anybody else has ever had that experience. I'm just speaking hypothetically. Um, but uh, here are the Israelites, and God knows what he's doing. I can tell you that we had every reason to freak out this week. But God knew what he was doing. God made a way. I didn't have the ability to make a way. No one in this room had the ability to make a way. But we trust in a God that brought us this far. And if he brought us this far, isn't he going to take us all the way to the promised land? So I want to encourage you today that God has a plan for your life. That he wants to do great and amazing things. But he's going to bring you into difficult places. Even after he sets you free. If we make that salvation, even after he saved you. There's still going to be some challenges in the road. And the first time that you hit that wall. The first time you get to the edge of the sea. And just because you can't see it. I would just hope that you look back and say, what did he do in the past? Because what he did is what he's going to do. God is the God of salvation. He's the only God that is able to make a way when there is no way. And I'm just guessing that if you're sitting in this audience and you've lived enough life, you can look back and say, man, but for the grace of God, I wouldn't be sitting in this room today. But God made away. Man, but for the grace of God, you wouldn't be married to the person that you're married to, but for the grace of God. Man, the children that you have, and you haven't messed them up more than you have, that's the grace of God that is working in you, because some of you, you're having to work against what you were raised in, and that programming isn't even there. you got to go find it. you got to absorb it through osmosis and other healthy relationships that are around you. you got to observe. you got to listen to what God teaches about the topic, but it's not going to come natural because in your natural state, if you are raised in brokenness, you will likely repeat brokenness unless you make an incredible change when it comes to allowing God to operate in your life. So we can see where we once were, and God is saying, based upon what I did in the past, this is what I want to do now. Point number two, second half of the sermon, forget the former things. He says, do not dwell on the past. I'll just let that sink in for some of you past dwellers, okay? Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? God says, this is what I've done. And then the second half, we're going to look at this is what... I'm going to do. Do not dwell on the past. Have you ever had someone that constantly tells the same story over and over again? Has anybody ever, ever been around that person? Anybody? Like, like their glory days? Anybody ever heard the same football story like a hundred times? Anybody? Like, you know, I think as I get older, I'm more like that. Is anybody, you know, I don't know. But one thing I love about Genesis Metro is we don't have to talk about the glory of ten years ago. We don't have to talk about the glory of 20 years ago. I can talk about the glory of two days ago. I can talk about the glory of two days ago when a church showed up on their weekend and gave it all that they had and sweat and, and tears and everything. People were cooking and bringing up food, which I really appreciate. We had some red beans and rice last night, and I enjoyed that a lot. Anyway, um, man, that God would show up through his people to do his word and his will. It's like... God says, this is what I've done, but this is what I'm going to do. And in order for me to do what I'm going to do, he said, you can't dwell on the past. We can reminisce about the past, but we cannot disregard the present. Hear me. 
We can reminisce about the past, but we cannot disregard the present. I know I'm out of the light. Don't worry. I feel it when I walk in the shadows, but I want to be close to my people. We're going to get this lighting fixed for next week, okay? But I want to be over here to tell I'm going to preach to you, okay? Man, I love 9750. I love all that. Man, the students last Wednesday night, y'all were worshiping your faces off. We got to the end, and you tell me the average student in America that's yelling, pleading, one more song, one more song. Man, that is incredible. Man, I want our kids to worship like that. And against our better judgment, though parents were waiting and probably grumbling themselves out in the parking lot, dude, what are, they don't ever get out on time. They were worshiping their faces off, and we'll take that. We'll take that. But if I come up here next year and we're talking about a year ago, then we will have failed you. I want to talk about in two weeks when Fuse kicks off their inaugural uh, service in, in this building because their room's not even ready over there. Like, dude, what if we had like 600 students in here for the first Fuse? Man, that'd be incredible, right? I want to talk about what God is doing right now. Not what God has done in the past, I want to talk about the now and the next. God says, do you not understand? Like, I know what I did in the past, but guess what? I'm getting ready to do something new. And for everyone that's walking through the doors for the first time in two weeks at our grand opening, man, it's not about the things that we've done in the past. It's about what we're going to do right now. It's about the next family that walks through the door. You want to know what motivates me when people say, Pastor Tim, how does it feel walking in this building after you've been waiting on it? You feel like, you know, it's over? No, I don't. I feel an incredible amount of stress. That's what I feel. I feel like, my gosh, now we got this. It's like all my life for the last 20 years has been building to this. Now you have this. It's like, no, it's not over. It's only begun. The next chapter is being written at your part of the story. Man, we get to do this together. I promise you, no one in Frisco, if you say, where is Genesis Metro? They didn't say, oh, it's over there by the train tracks, behind that row of trees, next to that rock place. No one in Frisco knew where Genesis Metro was, and yet we grew despite being in a hidden location. We were like a speakeasy of Frisco, Texas. <laughs> now we have this foundation, folks, and it doesn't take rocket science to figure out what's getting ready to happen. Incredible things are getting ready to happen. And the same thing that we needed to get here is the same thing we're going to need to get there. We need you. We need you. You say, well, I just walked in for the first time. I don't care. <laughs> if you're breathing, we need you. Pray, serve, share, give. That's what it took to get here. And the same thing that God did for the generation that came out of Egypt it's the same thing he was trying to do for the people that Isaiah was reading about. He didn't want to say, yeah, I did some things back then. He said, no, I'm doing some things right now. And so if you'll allow him, if you'll allow him in your life, and the next family that walks through the door, the next marriage that was <laughs> on shaky ground like you when you walk through the door, the next single person that has gone through hell that walks through the door, the next lost person who's going to give that church on El Dorado a chance, Just I'll just go down there at least see what they're about. Man, that person is worth eternity. Do you understand? And so I hope that you will treat it with that respect. That when you see someone walking through the building and new people kind of have a way of looking, you know, you are an ambassador why not shake their hand the way that someone shook your hand? Why not extend grace the way that someone extended grace to you? When you hear of a need and you're in a life group, you're in a community group, you're in a fuse group, don't wait for someone else to meet that need. If God put that person in front of you and you have the means to do it, then do it. You meet the need. Don't wait. Don't wait when God has put the opportunity right in front of you. I'm going to close with this verse. It says in Luke chapter 4, this is pretty cool. Um, just to give you a little bit of context, Jesus is walking in the temple and he's reading 
a scripture. So the way that their culture was set up, was like there was a reading every day, and it was kind of on a, it was a schedule. And so the day that he walked in to read this verse, it was scheduled. So when you see what he reads, you have to understand, like, imagine, like, there was a divine schedule, and Jesus was, like, at the right place at the right time, and he walks in to a bunch of people who aren't on Team Jesus, and this is what he says. He picks up a scroll, which, incidentally, is from Isaiah, but that's okay. You know, just what I was preaching today. See, there's symmetry behind it all that you don't even know about, but I know about it, and that makes me feel good. Um, it says, the Spirit of the, Lord, Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And when I think about my ministry and what God has called me to for the last 30 years, that's what he anointed me to do, is to preach good news. When you walk into Genesis Metro every single week, even when it's a truth that you don't want to hear, we are preaching good news. He says, he anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Some of you, when you walked in here, you were blind. Some of you, when you walked in here, you were deaf. Some of you, when you walked in here, you were captives. Some of you, when you walked in here, you were oppressed. But by the grace of God, the things that he has done in the past, he is doing today. Today I proclaim to you just as Jesus did. He read this scroll and he went and he sat down and when they asked him about it, he said, today this word is fulfilled. Today I say 3330 Genesis, 3330 El Dorado Genesis Metro, the promise is fulfilled right now. Right now. So now we have the promise it's time to settle the promised land. When they crossed over the Jordan River, river yeah, see, Moses, he got to take the people out. He didn't get to take the people in. When Joshua took the people in, there was still a, a city to win. Jericho's walls still had to fall. There's still a city for us to save. There's still lands for us to conquer. I think they had 31 kings that they had to fight. So just crossing over is not the win. The next victory is going to be to settle the lands, to expand the kingdom, for us to be able to grow this church, but then reach out much further than this. We, we have intentions to go much further in reaching thousands, hundreds of thousands in the end of souls for Christ. Man, the vision is, is so great about what we have the opportunity to do, and I hope that you're excited to go along on this journey. I hope that you will pray like you've never prayed before. I hope you'll give like you'll never give before. And I'm going to proclaim this scripture as a promise today, that this is the year of the Lord's favor. Let's mark October 15th of this year, and let's wait for October 15th next year, and I proclaim that we will have a year of favor. Now, I want you to remember that I said this, because when God pours it out like he's never poured it out before, he wasn't trying to get it it to you. He was trying to get it through you. So you remember this promise. And when God brings it to pass, I hope that you'll bring the favor of God into this room because, hey, we built it and now we have to pay for it. Are you guys ready? Are you guys ready? Are you guys ready? Let me pray for you and we are going to worship our faces off. Man, what a good Sunday. God, I pray for every person in this room that they have a place that they work. And now they have a place that they are, God. That you have brought them out of slavery. God, that you brought them out of their worst. And now, God, you want to bring us all into your best. I pray, God, for the passion. The passion to be in every believer. God, that it would be a fire that is burning in their soul to do your will. To seek your will in their life, God, to, to find out what does the Bible say? What am, I, what am I commanded to do in Scripture? I'm compelled by love, but I'm commanded by grace to give the gospel, to share the gospel, to live the gospel, which is that Jesus wants to save every soul that is around us. And man, if we have that vision, there's going to be opportunity. There's going to be opportunities that are presented to us in the next 12 months, man, this church is likely going to double in size. And if we double in size, what happens? We need to have double the volunteers. 
So you're sitting in here today as a guest. You're sitting in here today as a new person. But what about a year from now if you could have influenced 10 families, 20 families by the grace of God to find their best, find God's best for their life? Man, that would be worth it. That would be worth it. God, I pray that you would get all the glory. God, we thank you that your promises are true and that you brought it to pass. God, we say these things in the name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. Would you stand and worship with us?